الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين باعث الأنبياء والمرسلين ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين حبيب إله العالمين المصطفى أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المنتجبين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في كتابه المجيد وقرآنه الحميد وقوله الحق أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ويسألونك عن ذي القرنين قل سأتلو عليكم منه ذكرا إنا مكنا له في الأرض وآتيناه من كل شيء سببا فأتبع سببا صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوا على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد So my dear brothers and my dear sisters Last night we began our discussion about this personality that appears in the Quran only in this particular surah, Surah Al-Kahf, and nowhere else is he mentioned in the Quran. And this personality was who? Dhul Qarnayn. Very good. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. I understand after iftar, it's almost midnight, the people are still, you know, I'm, uh, I'm actually quite gr grateful to you guys for even being here. Um, I don't know how many cups of coffee, you know, have you had, had, had to have. I myself would have probably needed some more. But uh, we're talking about Dhul Qarnayn. This personality who is mentioned in the Quran only in this surah, Surah Al-Kahf. Nowhere else is he mentioned. Yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sometimes even in one verse, a personality that may be mentioned in one verse or a couple of verses. But due to the eloquence of the Holy Quran, the beautiful way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes that one personality, even in a verse or two verses, it describes to us, it gives us a lot of information about what kind of character did that personality have. Here we have about, for example, a page of discussion, maybe a bit more, of this personality, Dhul Qarnayn. Last night we mentioned, we started our discussion by first of all saying that when we take a look at historical anecdotes, we need to take a look at them from an analytical approach as opposed to just stating the events without analyzing them. We have to understand who was good, who was bad, what did the good do, why did the bad do bad things, why were they done and how can we avoid them or how can we mimic those who did a great job? So this is among the things we need to do when we study historical facts. In addition, we said that in Islam, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, out of the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we are blessed with so many stories in the Quran as well as the characters of Ahlul Bayt salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhim ajma'een, the history of Ahlul Bayt alayhim as -salam that Allah blessed us with all those stories, all these characters who were real characters, from whom we can derive real lessons. People who dealt with real people and how they interacted with them, as opposed to those who don't have such great personalities. They create fictional characters from whom then they try to derive lessons that they implicate or they learn from in their real life. Then we started our discussion about Dhul Qarnayn. We mentioned that it is said he is called Dhul Qarnayn. This is his title. This was not his real name. 
Why was he given this title? There are many reasons. We mentioned the three reasons. Do you guys remember what were, what were they? What was the first reason? He was wearing a helmet with two horns, which is the, the easiest one. That's the obvious one kind of thing that comes to people's mind. What else? He ruled the east and the west, the horn of the east, the horn of the west. So he kind of grabbed the horns of the world, and therefore he's called Dhul Qarnayn, the man of the two horns. And the third reason we mentioned, which was stated by Imam Ali Salamullahi Alayhi in a hadith, what did he say? People beat him on his head once, and they beat him twice, and kind of created a couple of bumps on his head. And that's what he was doing, inviting people to the path of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And Imam Ali said, amongst you is one who's just like him, referring to himself. After he was beaten twice, Allah kind of gave him a blessing, a reward, an ajr. And his ajr was, he allowed him and enabled him to rule on the earth. Because the man was dedicated genuinely for serving the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah rewarded him. All right. So in the ayat in Surah Al-Kahf, which commands from verse number 83, they ask you about Dhul Qarnayn. We mentioned that a group of Quraysh, the non-believers, they went as the people of the holy book, the scriptures, about personalities that they can quiz the prophet, our prophet on. So they told them, go ask him about the people of the cave. Go ask him about the man who learned, uh, who Musa followed to learn from him. And go ask him about the king who ruled the east or the west. Or the third question may have been, go ask him about the soul. So either way. Okay, so they ask you about Dhul Qarnayn. Say in response, قُلْ سَأَتْلُوا عَلَيْكُمْ مِنْهُ ذِكْرًا I will mention to you some verses of the Quran, some Quran. And we mentioned that this is also a lesson for us when you're asked a question to reflect before you jump to the answer. So the next question that we kind of left you with last night, do you remember what was the question? What was the question that I left you with? Who was Dhul Qarnayn? Who was Dhul Qarnayn? Here, there are four answers that we may provide. One, according to one of the big Sunni Mufassirin, interpreters of the Quran, commentators of the Quran, by the name of Al-Razi. Al-Razi suggests that such a king who rules the East and the West must have been someone who is well documented in history. And there is no one, according to him, better documented in history than Alexander the Great. And therefore, he says, Dhul Qarnayn must have been Alexander the Great. Why? Because again, he was a king. Two, he ruled quite a vast majority of land. Three, he's very well documented in history about a king who really ruled a lot of vast spaces. And therefore, in his opinion, Alexander the Great must have been Dhul Qarnayn, this personality. Okay, well, this is one opinion. However, this opinion may not be quite valid. The reason is because when you take a look at the history of Alexander the Great, yes, he was a king. Yes, he may have ruled a vast majority of land. However, he does not seem to be a believer, a devout worshiper of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the point that Allah describes Dhul Qarnayn. Later on, as we will read, Inna makanna lahu fil ard. We allowed him, we allowed Dhul Qarnayn to rule on the land. He was given that opportunity. And what else? We gave him من كل شيء سببا. We taught him the laws, the rules of how to make things happen, how to get work done. Well, Alexander the Great, a person who did not submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the way Allah wants to be submitted to, could not have been a person whom Allah says, we gave him, we allowed him, of course, he did work by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so Allah you know, inevitably did allow him. But not that Allah communicated with Alexander the Great, Allah kind of revealed to Alexander the Great, that, that apparently did not happen. So that's why this opinion may not be quite valid, because Alexander the Great's personality, his character does not fit the description mentioned in the Quran about a king who submitted to Allah, who believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who was such a devout worshiper, such a great leader, etc., etc. So that's the first opinion, though. The second opinion 
There was a famous historian by the name of Ibn Husham. Ibn Husham, in his history, he says, no, Dhul Qarnayn was one of the kings of Yemen. One of the kings of Yemen. Yemen had some kings. And Dhul Qarnayn must have been one of the kings in Yemen. And the dam that he built, which later on we will discuss, inshallah, in the surah, he built a dam. One of the things he did according to the to verses. This dam that he built is the dam that was in Yemen, the dam of Ma'rib. That's the dam that he built. So that's what he suggests. But again, that dam of Ma'rib, which was used to block the water, does not fit the description of the dam built here by Dhul Qarnayn, as we will learn later on, inshallah, in the stories as to how he built this dam. It's made of iron, the dam of Ma'rib is not made of iron, so the description does not fit either. So that second opinion may not also be quite valid. A third opinion, which emerged kind of in the early 20th century by one of the Indian ministers and national congress leader. His name was Abul Kalam Azad. Abul Kalam Azad did some research into this. He came to the conclusion that Dhul Qarnayn may have been Cyrus the Great, the Persian leader, the Persian emperor. Cyrus the Great was a king who ruled a vast majority of the land. He was a person who was kind. He is even mentioned in the Bible as the person who assisted the Jews in returning back to their homeland of Jerusalem. So he was a person that's mentioned in the Bible. He fits kind, some kind, somehow, the description that is mentioned in the Quran. And there may have been a prophet who was associated with him, who Allah used to reveal to him, and he would tell Cyrus the Great as what to do and what not to do. And that kind of fits the description. So that's another opinion. That's the third opinion. And this opinion is mentioned by this scholar, this Indian scholar that he was the Persian king, Cyrus the Great. Cyrus the Great, however, died in 530 BC, 530 BC, okay, so just before Christ. And that's what leads us to the fourth opinion. The fourth opinion suggests none of the above. He was a king who lived at the time of Prophet Ibrahim. This is based on some traditions, narrations. 530 BC does not match the timeline of a king who lived at the time of Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam. Prophet Ibrahim lived way earlier than that. It is said in some of the narrations he was a king who lived at the time of Prophet Ibrahim. In fact, it is said, it is also mentioned that the first two people on the face of this earth in our generation of Adam alayhi salam, so the progeny of our Adam, the first two people to ever shake hands where Dhul Qarnayn and Ibrahim, Khalilullah, they were the first two men to ever shake hands. They met at the Holy Kaaba, and Dhul Qarnayn had his army with him. When he saw Ibrahim, Khalilullah, praying there, he approached him, and humbly he extended his arms to shake that of Prophet Ibrahim. So he extended his arm back to shake his hand. So they both shook each other's hands. So there are these traditions. Now, these are the four opinions. The Quran itself did not tell us what was the name of this man, which means it's not so important. What's important is his actions. What's important is his character. That's what we need to concentrate on. So while it's good to have these opinions, but what really matters is not what was his name, but look at what he did. Nonetheless, there are these, the fourth opinions that we have. So one opinion is Alexander the Great by Al-Ghazi, but it might not be very valid. The second opinion, he may have been one of the kings of Yemen, but again, that also may not really fit the description. The third opinion could be Cyrus the Great. That might be it. It could be, possibly. Uh, but the timeline then won't match of some of the ahadith and the traditions. And the tradition suggests he lived at the time of Prophet Ibrahim, so it may have been someone else completely. That, again, we don't know. It's just the opinions that are out there. Now, what happened with this great man or this great king? 
It says, Inna makkanna lahu fil arv. We enabled him. Makkanna. We gave him the ability to go in the land, to walk on the land. And not only that, وَآتَيْنَاهُ مِنْ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ سَبَبًا And we taught him the laws of how to make things, how to do things. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed Dhul Qarnayn to utilize iron. He knew where to dig and look for iron. Not only that, he knew how to make blocks of iron. Not only that, he knew also how to build things using iron. Not only that, he also knew how to dig copper and find copper. Not only that, he knew how to mold copper into different shapes. So all this required knowledge. He knew a lot of things. God Almighty taught him. This takes us to a very important description. We gave him the laws, but he did something very important. He followed these laws, and that's important. God sometimes gives us gift. He gives us gifts. We need to utilize these gifts. Sometimes we don't. So this suggests to us that there are laws. There is a system that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made in this universe. And things go according to this system. This is an important thing that I would like to touch upon, brothers and sisters. Because this can take us to a really interesting discussion that is happening today. There are several scientists and writers who ask the question, does this universe have a creator? Do we have a maker? Or did we just come through an accident? Did the human being come onto the face of this earth through an accident? Or was it a calculated and measured creation? This is a very important and serious discussion that's been taking place for centuries, in fact, millennia. And it continues till this day and age. Those of you who know how to read Arabic well, if I may suggest to you to read a book called Kitab Al-Ihtijaj by Al-Allama Al-Tabrasi. That book contains several discussions between Al-Imam Al-Sadiq and atheists of his time. And surprisingly, you'll find a lot of these discourses were taking place back then, 1200 years ago, between Imam Al-Sadiq or 1300 years ago, between the Imam Alayhi and atheists of his time. Those of you who may not speak Arabic very well and cannot read Arabic very well, there's another book which is really good. It was first written in Arabic called Kitab At-Tawheed by Sheikh As-Saduq. You'll have to write the whole thing. So if you look for it online, Kitab Al-Tawheed by Sheikh As-Saduq, or Saduq, at least by Saduq. This book was written over a thousand years ago in Arabic. However, it's been recently translated well in English, a really good translation. I'm not sure if the whole English corpus is available online. If not, you may have to order it. However, that's a really good book to read. It contains, again, some of the arguments and discussions taking place between Imam al-Sadiq and other Imams among the atheists. They're bringing up some of the arguments. And it's quite interesting to see, it's quite nice and good to see how the Imam Salamullah Ali responded to some of these arguments which are still being posed today. A few years ago, I was invited to have a discussion at the University of Alberta in Canada with a professor of philosophy who was an atheist. And the whole discussion goes around whether there is a God or there is no God. Is there a creator or is there no creator? The professor was more inclined towards a theory that's called humanism. Humanism theory suggests that we be good humans and therefore we don't really need religious laws. Us being good humans. Generally speaking, the theory suggests people are humans, natural kind to each other. When they see someone, for example, falling on the street, 
collapsed, they would actually call the ambulance and try to help and instead of picking up the phone and just filming. When they see someone drowning, they would actually try to jump and save him and instead of, let's film him. So because human beings, generally speaking, are kind to each other, there's this whole theory. Of course, I'm, I'm, I'm oversimplifying the theory. It's, it's a big theory. It's a major theory. So this is very, very way, you know, oversimplification of it. But that's the bottom line, that we can, humanism, you know, we just act, act like human beings. Now, that theory in itself is not quite valid. And I'll tell you why. I won't use the United States as an example because your leadership is kind of, I mean, these days things have just, you know, I, I'll, I'm going to use Canada as an example. You know, you know, and I think you guys understand. Canadians were always open-minded, open-hearted, you know, we're kind people, we're quiet, you know. You hardly ever hear about us in the news, except when it's really good. Yeah. So, uh, I ask people, you know, generally speaking, do you think Canadians are good people? And they're like, yeah, they're, they're very nice people, they're very laid back. I said, okay, great, well, that's wonderful. Um, then how about this scenario? What if the Prime Minister of Canada comes out and says, Canadians, you, were, you know, we'll pretend you guys are all Canadians because I know you would love to have that, but it's okay. Um, Canadians, you're really wonderful people. You're so nice. You're great. We don't need laws in Canada anymore. Just be nice to each other. That's it. That's all we need because you guys are really good Canadians. You're really good citizens. So be kind. Be good humans towards each other. You think, will that be valid? Will that hold? Why? Why not? Humanism. Be kind. Be good to each other. What's the problem with that? Well, first of all, what is the definition of good? Define good. I'll give you a very simple example. Two scenarios. You have a business owner and you have employees. Okay, so you have the employer and the employees. Okay, the business owner says... I'm going to be a good citizen. Good. All right. By all means. Being good, according to me, since I'm the business owner, I have, let's say, 100 employees. Being good is if I can make more profit, and this way I can pay more taxes, and this way the state will make a lot of more money, and that's really being good. In order for me to make more profit, I'm going to have to cut down on the salaries of my employees to $5 an hour. That will be really good. Fantastic. This is being good. The employees will come and say, wait, wait, wait. That's nonsense. No, no, no. Being good is we want $20 an hour, for example. you know, Because then it will give us a stronger buying power. You know, I'll be able to afford, let's say, a bigger house, a better car, uh, things to buy for my children. Uh, afford to go on a vacation, and therefore I will drive the economy. And instead of you giving it to the state, and the state will give it back to me. No, no, I want to get it directly. And let me pay the taxes if necessary. Well, here, how do you solve that problem? What's good? The employer is looking at being good, and the employee is thinking of being good. That's why the state needs to intervene, and they have minimum Wages. They say, you know what? We understand you're an employee, an employer. We understand you own the business by all means. However, you cannot just pay your staff whatever you want to. There are some minimum standards that you have to adhere to. Okay, so you see, why do you need these laws? You have to have the laws. Otherwise, it'll be chaos. Another simple example, driving. Why do we need driving laws? We live in a free country. Isn't that what the president says? It's a free country. You can do whatever you want in this country. So why do we have laws of driving? Well, because we need laws. Without driving laws, it will be unsafe to drive on the streets. You'll have problems. A person would want to drive at 100 miles an hour. Another person would drive at 150 miles an hour. Freedom. 
Stop sign, why do you want to limit my freedom at stop signs? Red light, what do you mean red light? I want to drive the way I want. It's freedom of expression. I say by all means. We do have freedom of expression, my friend, but not when it comes to endangering your safety and the safety of others. That's why we need laws. Not only that, we need also law enforcement to enforce these laws. Otherwise, just laws by themselves are not even good enough. And we saw a few examples in the recent history when the law enforcement in this country is absent. What happens? Chaos in some cases. So that theory, while it may sound good in itself, doesn't work out. And that's why every country in the world has laws. And not only do they have laws, but they enforce these laws. Okay. So this discussion between myself and the professor, the professor came and introduced his concept of humanism, and then he had a seat. I came up and I said to the professor, I'm going to speak to you as a scientist, not as a man of religion. I did research for some time, for a few years, on diabetes and heart failure. There was a very sad statistic. The statistic suggests that 80% of diabetic patients may die from heart failure. That's unfortunately a fact. That's why there is consistent monitoring of diabetes, the blood sugar, and so on and so forth. Billions of dollars are invested just to monitor and make sure that the blood sugar is kept and maintained, and so on, to try to minimize this statistic. Billions of dollars are spent worldwide in research trying to figure out why. Well, we observe 80% of diabetic patients die from heart failure. The question is why? How come? What happens? Why does the heart muscle quit? So for decades, scientists, doctors, researchers, have been investigating, researching, trying to figure out why. Every year there are conferences where those scientists and researchers meet and try to present their research, trying to figure out what they found, trying to hopefully bridge this gap to hopefully one day find either a cure or stop it altogether. I said to the professor, imagine if one day in one of these conferences where you have thousands of scientists, researchers, scholars sitting down there discussing their research, a man gets up and says, guys, I have finally figured it out. I now understand why do 80% of diabetic patients die from heart failure. The reason is a random process of evolution. That's why. just a random process. So you guys have been wasting your time, money, energy, billions of dollars just gone to waste because it's just a matter of a random process of evolution. That's it. I said to him, honestly, professor, what do you think the people's reaction will be to this person? What will they say back to him? You've got like thousands of scholars, scientists, researchers, professors. What will their reaction be to this man? If they want to be kind, they will say, this is nonsense. You know, that's being kind. He will be dismissed. The response will be, what do you mean? 80% of diabetic patients are dying from heart failure, and you're telling us it's just a random process of evolution? That does not make any sense. In fact, as a side note, every university in the world today that does research and I discussed once to some of my colleagues, I said, do you know why they call it research? Because when you start your master's, you do search, and the search always fails. So you have to go back and research. And you keep on researching and researching, and finally, after five, six years of your PhD, you finally publish two, three hundred papers, and that's your whole PhD thesis. Your life of seven years or six years has just been compiled into three, four hundred pages which basically discuss your misery, your pain, and some of the success stories you might have had along the way. You know, that's basically what the PhD thesis is about. But nonetheless, of course, this is really, you know, it has some other useful stuff as well. You know, I, 
had to write one of those things before. So uh, every research which is done in the university is, is based on the foundation that there is a reason for some things to happen. Scientists are trying to discover the reasons. Why do earthquakes happen? Scientists want to discover it so that hopefully they can avoid it or minimize the damage when it happens, etc. Why or how do bees make honey? Scientists would like to know that. Maybe they can you know, increase the production of honey for financial reasons. That's another thing. Why does illness happen? Why do illnesses happen? Well, maybe we can stop them from happening, cure them, and prolong the life of humanity, have a better life, quality of life. So there are reasons. That's why there is research happening at all universities in the world. They're trying to find out reasons. Why? Why? So going back to the point, I told this professor, I said professor, now remember he was a professor of philosophy, so he, he totally understands logic. That's one thing I knew he does. So I said to him, doctor, if scientists cannot accept that a heart can fail from a random process of evolution, do you want me as a scientist to accept then that this whole universe with the billions of reactions that occur, that occur in it on a daily basis came into existence through a random process? You know his response? He says, well, maybe we do not understand the source. Again, I repeat that. Maybe we do not understand the source. That was his reply. My response was, we're not discussing about understanding the source. Our discussion is about the existence of a source. And you have just confessed <laughs> that there has to be a source. Now, you may want to call him a source, you want to call, call him a designer. You call him whatever you want to call him. I'm going to call him God or Allah. There has to be a creator. There has to be a maker. There has to be a designer. There has to be a source. So you see, a simple, logical argument. Deductive reasoning. And a man who understands deductive reasoning could not deny it. Simple argument. This is something important. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created this whole universe based on laws. And Allah created these laws. Scientists are trying to discover these laws. Trying to find out these laws. And they're trying to find out ways to sometimes manipulate these laws for various reasons. Which means that Lawlessness could not have produced these laws. You have had to have a designer, a maker, someone who's perfect to create all this. There has to be a creator. There has to be a God. And that's something I would like to add, my brothers and sisters, about the religion of Islam. The religion of Islam. We have what we call usul al-deen, the roots of the religion. That's our ID as Muslims. If they ask you as a Muslim, what's, like, what do you believe in? What makes you a Muslim? There are three main things that makes us Muslims. Three main things. In the school of Ahlul Bayt, two more things are added. But, but they stem from these three things. The first thing is the belief in God. Monotheism. We're a monotheistic religion. As a Muslim, I believe in God. One God, he's the creator of this heaven and earth and everything that exists within them. This God has no partners, no associates, no children. This God is all-knowing, all-capable, and he created this whole universe. Okay, that's one. This God is also very just. And that's what justice, divine justice, stems from tawheed, from monotheism. Divine justice. He gave us free will. And therefore, on the day of judgment, he will judge us. If you choose to follow, then you'll be rewarded. If you choose not to follow his laws, there will be consequences. And that will happen on the day of judgment and on this earth. 
So that's divine justice. What else do you believe in? Well, I believe in all prophets. I believe in prophets. God sent us prophets. He wanted us to worship him. Well, how do we worship him? He sent us prophets to teach us, to educate us. Starting with Prophet Adam, peace be upon him, and concluding with the last messenger, our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. All these prophets were sent to guide us, to teach us. Okay, well, after the last prophet, does that stop? We say no. There is divine succession to prophethood. And that's in the madhab of Ahlul Bayt, what we call imamah, the imams. There are imams, starting with Imam Ali alayhi salam, tomorrow whom we will discuss and talk about his martyrdom, peace be upon him, because it coincides with his martyrdom. And the last one is our Imam Al-Mahdi Al-Muntadar, Ajallah Ta'ala Farajahu Sharif. The 12 Imams. So that's what we call divine succession. And that's what the school of Ahlul Bayt, the Imamis, believe in. Okay, well, what else do you believe in? We say the third thing and most important is Qiyamah, Day of Judgment. There is a Day of Judgment. That one day we will all be resurrected and we'll be held accountable for our deeds. Justice will be served. So they believe in monotheism. They believe in God's divine justice. They believe in the prophets. They believe in the imams, which is in the school of Ahlul Bayt. And they believe in the day of resurrection. All Muslims accept monotheism, accept prophethood, and accept their day of resurrection. In the school of Ahlul Bayt, we have two more components added, which is divine justice and imamah. What's important, my dear brothers and sisters, something which is unique to Islam, is that all these five things can be proven through logic, reason, and rationale just like I did earlier with this professor. I did not need a single verse from the Quran to convince him that there is a God. Nor did I need to quote a hadith from the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, or one of the ma'asumin, the imams. We just use rational reasoning, deductive reasoning, and we proved it. That's important because it's one of the, fund it's the fundamental belief, the foundation in our religion. Some other religions, for example, struggle with that. I'll give you an example. A few years ago, a professor of Catholicism requested to bring some of his students who were studying Catholicism, graduate students, to come to the mosque and to have me give them a lecture. He says, we're doing a lecture about Islam and it will be nice for them to learn about Islam from an imam as opposed to me teaching them about Islam. And also it's nice to give them the experience of a mosque. So I said, by all means, you're more than welcome to come. So he came and there, he had about maybe seven or eight graduate students along with him. And I was talking about, you know, the fundamentals of Islam. One of the things I mentioned was exactly what I just spoke, told you guys. That, you know, in, in Islam, thank you so much. In Islam, we have the five fundamental beliefs in the school of Ahlul Bayt as Shia Muslims. And all these five can be proven through logic, reason, and rationale. The professor's response, who himself is a father, of course, he's a Catholic father, and he's a professor. He has PhD as well. His response was, well, it's the same thing in Catholicism. You know, our fundamental beliefs can also be proven through logic, reason, and rationale. My response, was father for my own sake of knowledge you know I, I want to learn but to the best of my understanding the concept of trinity the father son and the holy spirit that concept that all three are one and the one are three that is not a logical based concept that's a faith based concept is that true he paused for a couple seconds and he said, yes, you're right. I said, thank you. And then I moved on. And I told him, <coughs> I told him before that though, I told him, Father, correct me if I'm wrong, but the belief in Trinity is like the root of the religion in Catholicism. It's like something fundamental to Catholicism. He says, yes, that's right. So that's when I went ahead and said, well, to the best of my knowledge, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's a faith-based concept. 
it's not a logical based concept in a way. Yes. So when you have a fundamental concept in the faith, in the religion, which is not logical, but it is faith based, that can create problems sometimes to some people to start reflecting. I have personally come across three or four people myself who've converted from Catholicism to Shia Islam. And among their reasons is this issue. How could one be three and three be one? It's not a logical based concept. So when they learn about Islam, especially the Islam of Ahlul Bayt السلام, that God is one, he cannot be divided into parts, that makes perfect sense. He does not have any children. Lam yalid wa lam yulad wa lam yakul lahu kufuan ahad. He did not have children, nor was he had himself. He was not begotten, nor did he beget. And there is nothing like him. So this is something important in the religion of Islam. It's a fundamentally logical religion. Once the logic makes sense, then yes, you believe in it. If you accept the logic, you believe in it. Then you believe in the Holy Quran. Okay? Once you believe, I mean, you accept the logic. Okay, I presented you with the logic. Is there a God? Yes, there is. For whatever reasons, you know, I gave that description. Said, okay, fine, I accept. You accept all the prophets. Yes, okay, I fine, I, I take that. Day of judgment and so on and so forth. Imams, divine justice. All right, I accept it all. Well, then do you believe in it? Yes, I do. That's your choice. You want to believe it or not. But once you believe in it, you say, you know what? It makes sense. And I believe in it. I accept it. We say, okay, now you've become a Muslim. You've become a Muslim. Okay, what do I do now? You say, well, now we have branches of the religion. The branches. You have to pray five times a day. Fast the holy month of Ramadan. Perform your pilgrimage. Pay your khums. Pay your zakat, etc., etc. These are the branches of the religion. This is not the core, not the fundamentals. It's the branches. When it comes to the branches of the religion, and that's where I would like you to pay attention. When it comes to the branches of the religion, yes, sometimes it is faith-based. Sometimes we don't have all the answers. For example, men in Islam are not allowed to wear gold. They cannot wear gold. Say, why not? Say, well. Do you accept the Quran? Do you accept the words of Allah? Do you accept the words of the prophets? And so on and so forth. You accept everything? Okay, we have a hadith. You know, it's a tradition that men are not allowed to wear gold. You have the entire periodic table for God's sake. You can wear all these medals on the periodic table. There is just this one medal on the periodic table, which you need to avoid if you're a man wearing it, that is. And that's the gold. If you really want to look fancy and sharp, well, there's something even more expensive than gold. Platinum. Go buy platinum. That's permissible. It's even more expensive than gold. You know? So that's permissible. But gold is not allowed. Okay. Now some people say, well, you know what? Maybe it interacts with the red blood cells. Uh, it can create. We say maybe, maybe. But that is not the reason why it's haram. Because the fiqh says, suppose you have a gold ring, for example. Gold ring. They say it's by the appearance. So chemically speaking, if I take a gold ring, and I do some chemical reaction to it, electroplating it, with a very, very thin layer of silver, very, very thin, like five nanometers. You can't even see it. When you look at the ring, you say, this is a gold ring. Then can I wear it now? You say, no, you still cannot wear it because it looks like a gold ring, and therefore you cannot wear it. But you say, well, it's not gold really because I've got re this really thin layer of silver that's protecting it. Therefore, it's not going to touch my skin, you know, the gold. You say, that's fine, but that's not the reason. You're not allowed to wear it because it looks gold. And if it is gold and it looks gold, then you're not, you're not allowed to wear it. Well, why? This is a faith-based concept. Ahlul Bayt, the Quran, sometimes gave us some of the reasons, but not everything. Okay. Our job is to accept. That's why, what is the name of our religion? Islam. What does Islam mean? Submit. You have to submit. Now, when it comes to usul al deen you can ask all questions that you want. Prove to me there is a God. Prove to me this God has no part. We can, uh, we can have all these kind of discussions, by all means. 
when it comes to usul, the roots, these five things I told you about. Once we discuss those, we come to the branches. The branches then, some of them we understand why. Alcohol, why can't we drink alcohol as Muslims? Well, there are many reasons. The Quran says it will create problems for you. It will be harmful to you. And this harm is multitude, multifaceted. A harm, for example, in Canada, I don't know about US statistics, but in Canada, for example, four people die every single day in Canada from drinking and driving accidents. Every day, four people, God forbid, imagine, look at around you here. Every day we lose four people, God forbid. Within a few days, there'll be no one left here anymore. So you, you can imagine the magnitude of the seriousness of this. And this is despite all this kind of uh, advertisement, stop drinking, don't drink and drive, don't drink and drive, still you have four people dying every single day. And that's not to talk about domestic violence problems, not to talk about you know, addiction problems, not to talk about et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All these other problems. That are true. So that one we understand. We have been given reasons. But some aspects we don't have reasons. But that does not mean we reject them. We accept them. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, my dear brothers and my dear sisters, created a system. And this system points us to him, to his existence, that he exists. Because he has to be a designer, as that professor called it, a source. So there has to be a maker. And despite what you read from some prominent scientists today, that there is no God, you know, science has just proved to us that God is not necessary, blah, blah, blah. With all due respect, all those scientists who actually write about this, some of them are prominent physicists, other writers, these guys, while I truly respect their fields of expertise, physics, you know, whatever field they, they come from, but when it comes to theology, it's just a theory because this is not their field. They're not theologians. So they're writing. They're stepping outside their boundaries of expertise, which then calls them you know, responsible, and we can critique them. That's what they believe. That's what they state, but it does not necessarily be true. In fact, I remember there was a, a mathematician, a very prominent mathematician, who was arguing against some of those scientists that there is a God. You know. Interestingly, this mathematician, when he starts his speech, his discussion, he says, I just want to let everyone know that I am a mathematician. I'm not a the theologian. You know. But I feel it is necessary for me to speak because many people are reading these books and they're being influenced by them. So I find it, it's you know, obligatory upon me to give also my view as a mathematician. So it's quite interesting. The guy his, himself says that, I'm not a theologian. This is not really my cup of tea, but I have to speak about it. So that's why, my brothers and sisters, when you start reading about all this, don't be just you know, taking it for granted that it has to be authentic, it has to be true because it comes from so-and-so person or that person who writes really well. They may, they may be very good writers, but does not mean that their arguments are quite valid. In fact, one of the major people who writes about the idea that there is no God. A few years ago, interestingly, he was interviewed. And he was asked, on a scale from 1 to 7, where 7, you are absolutely convinced that there is no God, what would you rank yourself as? He says 6.9. He was asked, well, why not seven? He's like, well, you know what? To be honest with you, I cannot, listen to this, I cannot conclusively state that there is no God. He's basing his all argument on an assumption. I cannot conclusively state that there is no God but I live with the assumption there is no God. Can you imagine that? Quite an interesting thing. When I read this, I said, subhanAllah, this guy has written books about the non-existence of God. Thousands, if not millions of people have read his books and they're now influenced by his talk because he's a good writer. And he is just writing on the basis of an assumption. A man came to Imam al-Sadiq. This is what this reminded me of. And I'll conclude with this, inshallah. A man came to Imam al-Sadiq, alayhi salam, and after a discussion about, you know, he was an atheist man. And he told the imam, you know, I still don't believe. The imam then replied to him. He said, listen, if 
if, hypothetically speaking, if what you're saying is right, if there is no God, and we believe in a God, and we pray and fast and do all these things, then at the end, we haven't lost anything. We haven't lost anything. And when we die, we didn't lose much. Or rather, I lived a good life. I was a good person. Being a good person, I earned the love of people, the respect of people. So I did not lose anything. And if what you're saying is not true, and what you're saying is not true, that there is no God and all that. That's not true. However, if there is a God, then we have won and you have lost. So if there is no God, and that is not the case, there is a God. But hypothetically speaking, for the sake of argument, if there is no God, we haven't lost anything. But if there is a God, then we've won and you've lost. You know, that's quite interesting. So don't just base your whole argument on an assumption, misguiding millions of people or thousands of people. And Allah says in the Quran, it's all based on one assumption. That assumption does not substitute the truth. It's a fact. So this is something we learn from the story of Dhul Qarnayn, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created a system. Dhul Qarnayn was taught the laws of the system. And Dhul Qarnayn used that system to spread justice on earth, as we will learn, inshallah, over the next few nights. Now, for the next three nights, if Allah gives us tawfiq, we're going to take a break from the story of Dhul Qarnayn because we have tomorrow the night of Qadr. Is that right? Yes. And the eve of the, basically the strike of Imam Ali sallallahu alayhi. Then, so we'll dedicate the next three nights for Imam Ali sallallahu alayhi. And then we'll come back for one night to discuss about Dhul Qarnayn. Then again, take a break for the night of Qadr, the third night of Qadr, inshallah, where we'll talk about the holiness of the night of Qadr, and then we'll com continue with the remaining nights of the holy month of Ramadan about the story of Dhul Qarnayn. So hopefully that will give us enough time to discuss the story and complete it, inshallah. At this point, if I may request you all to please raise your hands for dua. We are on holy nights of this holy month. And inshallah, your requests and your needs will be fulfilled. A'udhu billahi min shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. أَمَّنْ يُجِيبُ الْمُضْطَرَّ إِذَا دَعَاهُ وَيَكْشِفُ السُّوءُ 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 اللهم إنا نسألك وندعوك باسمك العظيم الأعظم الأعز الأجل الأكرم يا الله 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 إلهي بفاطمة وأبيها وبعلها وبنيها والسر المستودع فيها اكشف عنا السوء يا الله اللهم اغفر ذنوبنا كفر عنا سيئاتنا وتوفنا مع الأبرار مع محمد وآله الأطهار اللهم اقض حوائج المؤمنين والمؤمنات شافي وعاف جميع مرضى المؤمنين والمؤمنات اللهم ومن أوصانا بالدعاء من المؤمنين والمؤمنات اقض حوائجهم شاف مرضاهم احفظهم في أوطانهم وديارهم بحفظك ورحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين رب اغفر لي ولوالدي وارحمهما كما ربياني صغيرا اجزهما بالإحسان إحسانا وبالسيئات غفرانا رب اجعلني مقيم الصلاة ومن ذريتي ربنا وتقبل دعاء اللهم عجل لوليك الفرج واجعلنا من شيعته وأنصاره وأعوانه والمستشهدين بين يديه اللهم كن لوليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا 
برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم أرنا الطلعة الرشيدة والغرة الحميدة واكحل أنظارنا بنظرة منا إليه إلهنا مولانا ونقسم عليك بالزهراء فاطمة إلا ما